It's 19 hours GMT. Hello, good evening to you. Welcome to the News 360. And it's live. My news up here at Tadesawe in Kanda. My name is Alfred Akonsi. And I'm Natalie Ford. So look at the top stories this evening. News 360 headlines is brought to you by... Two labor unions urge the Bank of Ghana to publish list of non-performing banks. Meanwhile, the minority in parliament blames government for Unibank's insolvency. Also ahead this evening, all 14 persons on trial over murder of Major Maxwell Mahama plead not guilty to charge of abetment of crime conspiracy to commit murder and murder. Also on the international front, Nigerian government says 101 of the 110 Nigerian schoolgirls kidnapped by militants in Dapchi last month have been returned. We have some sports and entertainment news ahead of the bulletin tonight. Remember, we're live on DSTV channel 279, also on Facebook and on, on 3news.com. Remember, you can also join us with your thoughts, your views, your comments as we get interactive. But our first story tonight, a former deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, Emmanuel Esierumante, has dismissed assertions the central bank is targeting to, um, to fold up indigenous banks in the country. He said the Bank of Ghana should rather be commended for following the requirements within the banking laws to save undercapitalized banks. He was speaking and reacting to the recent happenings within the banking sector. In August 2017, the Bank of Ghana revoked the licenses of the UT and Capital Banks, describing them as deeply insolvent. The latest bank to be declared insolvent is Unibank, bringing the number of distressed indigenous banks to three. The central bank is receiving a lot of backlash for recent happenings within the banking sector, but a former deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, Emmanuel Esiedumante, insists the central bank has played its mandated role well per the banking laws. The truth of the matter is that once you're given a banking license, you come under the banking law of the country. And the banking law and other regulations that Bank of Ghana issues from time to time. And there are specific requirements that you must be liquid, and there are ratios to check on that. You must be solvent, there are also ratios to check on that. And then you must be profitable. So it's not any deliberate attempt to which hunt any local bank. It's a question of whether they are obeying the rules as laid down in the banking law or not. On the Unibank KPMG takeover, he believes it is still early days yet to determine if the fortunes of Unibank can be turned around within six months, as the central bank expects. Depends on what KPMG sees over there and how quickly they are able to resolve the situation. So after they've been there for six months, they will submit a report to the governor who will then review it and decide on the way forward. But for now, it's difficult to tell what the findings are going to be. He has further cautioned banks to take corporate governance serious and respect the rules of the central bank. Those who are managing banks should bear in mind that there's something like corporate governance. They should make sure that they meet and then when they do, management brings them the financials so they know the health of the institution they are supposed to be presiding over. And also bear in mind that it's people deposits people's savings that you're working with. Let's stay in the finance sector. As banking consultant Dr. Richmond Ichiahene says, the central bank need not be lauded for appointing KPMG as administrators to save Unibank from collapsing. According to Dr. Ichiahene, the central bank must act swiftly to save six other banks from imminent collapse. 
The banking consultant described the role of the central bank as reactionary. Dr. Etuahini revealed six other banks are in a similar situation and the central bank must be decisive on it and approach it as it was done in the 1980s when a bailout strategy was provided. We should be looking at looking at a holistic approach to resolve this in totality rather than approaching in piecemeal because we haven't even finished with UT and Capital Bank. Today we are saddled with uh, administration of another bank. Maybe in three months' time, another one will come. And then we'll design another strategy for it. So I was thinking that we should look at it broadly and see, as it was done in 1988, when the public sector banks were all distressed, we decided to have a bailout strategy for all the banks. He cautioned the central bank to be wary in its regulatory forbearances. There were regulatory forbearances for two years. If the stick has been hit, has hit in the last, early two years, maybe we wouldn't have this sitting on it. So the regulatory forbearances Bank of Ghana must also be aware. Delaying to act causes us to do a financing. That one Ghanaians should understand. The more we delay about these, the six, the more we are bailing them out, the more some of them may not even survive. And at the end of it all, the debt will be a Ghanaian debt. Let's just say on this matter, because the minority in parliament is blaming government for Unibank's insolvency. Well, minority spokesperson on finance, uh, Kassela Tufosing, is saying that government is gradually ceding the financial sector to foreigners, which he says should be condemned. Kaisel Atuforsen said it is unacceptable for government to allow the largest indigenous bank to collapse. He regretted UT and capital banks collapsed under the watch of this same government. Recently we were told that UT Bank and Capital Bank that collapsed costed the taxpayer an amount of 2 billion Ghana cities. Look, Unibank is bigger than UT and Capital Bank put together, or it's about the same size. So if that will cost us 2 billion cities, then this one is also going to cost us 2 billion cities. The two put together, the taxpayer, you and I, we are going to spend 4 billion Ghana cities, 2% of GDP, in servicing this debt. And the government is supervising this bank to collapse. He was worried the financial sector was being ceded to foreigners. I'm aware of another bank, another bank that is in a serious problem than this. Today, nobody can tell me that jobs will not be lost. Another bank will take over Unibank, mark it on the wall, in the next six months, even before then. It cannot be true that within six months they will turn around this bank. If they claim that the capital adequacy ratio has gone to negative 24 and they are saying that technically insolvent, how can they do it in 24 months, uh, in, in six months? If it can be done... Now, two labor unions have urged the Bank of Ghana to publish the list of non-performing banks. Member of the National Association of Graduate Teachers and the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union felt this has become necessary in order to safeguard second-tier pension funds of workers. The leadership of the union spoke exclusively to TV3's Daniel Opoku. The National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAT, and the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, ICU, were reacting to the Unibank takeover by the central bank. NAGRAT expressed disgust about the inability of some banks to generate returns on their investment. The national president of NAGRAT, Enje Kabonu, urged Bank of Ghana to explain why some banks are gradually folding up. I am proposing measures. That is one difficulty that we have not been able to come to as a people in this country, where businesses to merge together to create a very strong capital base. Everybody wants to operate in his whole. Everybody wants to operate individually, regardless of how weak you are. You understand? So at the end of the day, any small uh, uh, financial upheaval cramples you down. He again urged the Bank of Ghana to publish the names of local banks in good standing. Assuming I have invested teachers' monies or the other tier two monies with a financial institution that is not doing too well, then I have every cause to worry uh, for the future of myself and my members. Members of the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union lauded the central bank for tightening its supervisory role. The General Secretary, Solomon Kote, suggested the need for local banks to merge into one consortium to meet the minimum capital requirements of the Bank of Ghana. It's even 
cascaded down to the rural banks, okay, where in their case, I think they were given 200 million or so to raise. You know, so if uh, you realize that you are not able to do that, that will mess because the banks are becoming too many in this country. Solomon Kotei pleaded with the Bank of Ghana to ensure the conditions of service of affected staff of the bank are respected. You don't have a union, and the union also don't have maybe that type of agreement I'm spelling out. Then what will be left is what is the conditions under which they were engaged. If not, what we have seen in other places where they do mass redundancies, the workers will be given the right to have an attorney or to have a representative to go into negotiations with the owners of the business and then they are paid off. Both unions implored the Bank of Ghana to ensure the interest of customers is protected. Well, Unibank branches nationwide have opened for normal business after Tuesday uh, takeover by the Bank of Ghana, leading to the temporary closure. Wednesday morning, the Bank of Ghana on Tuesday appointed KPMG as administrator for Unibank. The appointment of KPMG, according to the central bank, is aimed at saving the bank from immediate collapse. Unibank had earlier notified the public that a bank would open its doors at 12 noon. The central bank, as regulators, handed over managerial powers of Unibank to audit firm KPMG at least for the next six months. According to Bank of Ghana, Unibank's capital adequacy ratio, CAR, has fallen below 50% of the required minimum of 10%, that is below 5%. Head of audit at KPMG, Anthony Sapon, assured the public KPMG will fix the situation and return the bank to private management. We as official administrators, once we've come in, one of our mandates in the first 30 days that the law requires is to establish the true state of the bank, and we are going to do that. Some customers of the bank were relieved to find it open for business soon after midday. It has happened to me, but this is not the first time. I have visited with UT Bank, but when I got to the bank, they explained to me that no, it's just merge, merging, a change of name, but the transaction and the institutions are not going to change to the same uh, thing we are going to, the same service. The development is coming in the wake of a recent botched transfer of shares between the largest shareholders of ADB, Bellstar Capital and Unibank. See, the issue of corporate governance has been a major factor in the crisis which has hit some of Ghana's banks. Now, the governor of the Bank of Ghana, if you call Dr. Ernest Addison, last year blamed the lack of good corporate governance for the collapse of UT and Capital Bank. Now, according to Dr. Addison, good corporate governance is not only essential to minimizing risks, but it's also fundamental to improving economic performance. Now, we have a unit bank situation now. And one of the factors out of the 10 is a lack of good corporate governance. Now, so what exactly is the reason why these banks are not adhering to good corporate governance practices? Justice Ewukusao is the chief executive officer of the Institute of Directors Ghana. He joins me in studio for a discussion on this. Thank you for your time. Good evening to you. Good now, evening. I mean, this chorus of lack of good corporate governance keeps running through the song that the, 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 the regulator tells us every time a bank, you know, either is insolvent or collapses in this country. What is corporate governance in, in summary? Okay. Basically, corporate governance refers to the system whereby companies are directed and controlled. That's a very simple definition. But again, it also involves policies, procedures, and processes whereby the work of the organization is done. And it also involves rule of law. Again, by corporate governance, we are referring to a situation whereby economic and social resources of the nation of, of an organization are done to the maximum. That is in a, a very effective manner. So when we are talking about the system whereby companies are directed and controlled, we are interested in procedures, some procedures taking place in organization. We are also interested in effective maximization of social and economic resources. So in this sense, the regulator has the direct mandate, in this sense the Bank of Ghana, to ensure that the banks that it issues banking licenses to adhere to these corporate governance practices, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it should, first of all, be the responsibilities of the boards of directors to ensure that there is sound corporate governance within the organization. 
so that they don't even give the regulator the chance to come in and then to you know, give them instructions. But in an event where that, that organization is not adhering to the good corporate governance structures, the regulator has to make it happen. That's why there, there's what? A, a monitoring department at the Bank of Ghana. Yeah, so, yeah, right. so, I mean, so why are we confronted with this kind of song every time that there's lack of good corporate governance, which is one of the contribut major contributing factors to this precarious situation that the sector finds itself in? Yeah, it's because we don't actually understand corporate governance. Normally, corporate governance should ensure that companies do not collapse or fail. But unfortunately, it is when companies fail, then we start talking about corporate governance. So, so it becomes a sing song within, organiza uh, within the whole nation. So now, it is, you see, when you want to appoint, a, say, a financial controller, mm. you don't pick anybody in the street. So many people would want to advertise, you go through interview process. Sometimes it takes about two or three rounds before the person is selected. But look at directors. You meet a friend in the street, you have a company, can you join me to become a director? He says yes. If you take the public sector, government is looking for party faithfuls to put them on board. So as long as they haven't got them, you find companies working without boards. Com uh, directorship is now a competence-based profession, like accountancy or law. So we, we must get it right and do the right thing. Otherwise, all that we are doing, we are wasting our time. We are wasting our time. You seem to spread the tentacles of this discussion into the public sector, and that's a, a rather you know, worse situation, right? So have you done any audit of corporate governance adherence in this country? Or is there a global audit? And, and what's the position of Ghana globally? Good. There was a survey by ACC and KPMG. KPMG is uh, going to take over Unibank mm -hmm. Manage. Interesting. And uh, for 15 African countries, and you, you'll be surprised that Ghana placed 12 above 12 Somalia. Out of 15. <laughs> out of 15. 12 above Somalia and a few other places that are not doing well. But the first was South Africa, followed by Kenya, Nigeria. But we placed 12. Tell you that straight away the corporate governance practices in the nation are quite low, even within the African continent. So if you take it to the worldwide stage, then obviously we are nowhere. So what do we do? I'm not interested. We know the problem. Should there be a corporate governance audit? I mean, what, what should be done? No, there should first of all be the commitment that we really want to get out of the situation where we are. If you are sick and you don't want to go to the hospital or the doctor, you stay where you are. So the commitment should be there. Companies are collapsing and we can't tell. So we, we should be committed and we should put in place rigorous measures in appointing directors. As I've said, a direct directorship is a competence-based profession. Don't just put anybody there. They will go and mess you up. So let's get things right, get the right people there, as we do for money. Sometimes managers in organizations are better experienced, better qualified, mm -hmm. more skillful but, than those who are supposed to direct them. So what are you doing over there? In that case, they will only let you know what they think you should know. And this is part of the problem. So, so I'm grateful for your Thank time. You so much. Much. Thank you so much. Justice Sao uh, Wukusao is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Institute of Directors Ghana. There, uh, giving us a lot more on this. But on an MTN video report tonight, Isahaku Abdullahi reports from Gumani in Tamale on a major drain left uncovered which poses a threat to residents in the community. This was a contract that was actually awarded by the previous administration to Kamara Construction Limited to construct this major drain in this part of the community so as to alleviate the people of this community from the consistent flooding anytime it rains. As you can see, the banks of this gutter is not covered. As a result of the contractor's negligence and lack of human feet has caused this particular institution to actually lose its class, uh, three classrooms, a toilet, and a urinary pit. This has caused us a lot in terms of teaching and learning. Efforts were made to even call the contractor to come and assess the level of damage caused by the school. But all this while, we've not heard anything from the contractor himself. We want to appeal to authorities concerned 
to make sure things are done before things finally get out of hand. Reporting from Gumani, Tamil in the northern region, this is Isaku Abdallah. So you see, we expect that people who have to move to attend to this situation will do so swiftly. But you can also send your videos and your video report via WhatsApp number 055 1433044. As we encourage citizens journalism. We'll be back shortly with some more stories on News 360. Do stay. Why, right, thanks so much for staying with us on News 360 Time for Business with me, Nanekuya Mensa Brampa. I'm sure you've had a feel of Unibank BOG, KPMG, Martyrs Arise. But TV2 Business analyzes or analyzes the different reasons given by the central bank, which resulted in the appointment of KPMG as the administrator of the bank well the bank of ghana believes that allowing uh, the continuation of unibank's activities in its current state will be detrimental to the whole banking system according to the bank of ghana appointing kpmg as auditors and official administrators became necessary due to the following facts unibank persistently maintained a capital adequacy ratio below zero currently at negative 24 percent Unibank persistently suffered liquidity shortfalls and consistently breached its cash reserve requirement, resulting in liquidity support from the BOG amounting to over 2.2 billion cities. Unibank failed to comply with directive from the BOG, prohibiting it from granting new loans and incurring new expenditure. Unibank borrowed from the interbank market without written approval from the Bank of Ghana when its capital adequacy ratio was less than 10%. Unibank refused to cooperate with the BOG in the performance of its supervisory responsibilities, including deliberately concealing some liabilities from its balance sheet, poor corporate governance and risk management practices which made the bank vulnerable to macroeconomic shocks, significant transactions with its parent company and affiliate companies including connected lending and other related party lending. The governor announcing the appointment of KPMG as administrators of the bank assured customers deposits with Unibank are safe. The bank would continue to run as usual. Nobody would lose money. We've proven that earlier. Let me repeat that nobody would lose money in this exercise. Right, let's now move away from issues on banking. And President Ikufado has signed three legal and trade instruments to promote trade across the continent following a formal launch in Kigali, Rwanda, at the extraordinary session of the Assembly of Heads of State and Government of the African Union. The three legal instruments, namely the agreement establishing the continental free trade area, the protocol on free movement of persons, and the Kigali Declaration are expected to bring the continent free trade area initiative to reality. The agreement, which was reached at the extraordinary session of the African Union in Kigali, Rwanda, will now ensure the expansion of the intra-Africa trade through better harmonization and coordination of trade liberalization and facilitation regimes and instruments across the continent. The agreement will also pave way for the creation of a single continental market for goods and services with free movement of businesses and investment while enhancing the acceleration of the establishment of a continental customs union. With Africa's population set to reach some 2 billion people in 20 years, an African common market presents immense opportunities to bring prosperity to the continent through hard work, entrepreneurship and creativity. And the project Maji Foundation, a non-profit foundation, has to date provided over 15,000 Ghanaians with access to safe drinking water. Project Maji Foundation is seeking to provide 11 million people in several communities with portable water by 2025. World Water Day was established in 1992 by the United Nations as a day for the international community to learn more about water-related issues and be inspired to take action. 
Project Maji Foundation has provided safe drinking water to over 15,000 people in rural communities and its ninth site has just opened in Ghana. Project Maji was established in 2015 and has designed and developed a solar-powered water kiosk pumping system ideally suited for deployment in rural communities and is designed to work reliably with almost no maintenance in the harshest environment. To commemorate World Water Day, the foundation announced the opening of its ninth site in Ghana. I, I understand what is required to make sure that something is, has longevity and, and carries on. This is not something, there's not sites we want to put there and see them as white elephants in, in two years' time, three years' time. We want to make sure that they are viable, running, communities are served for the long, long term. World Vision and, and VRA, they are paying for their sites. Uh, we have uh, Binaton and some other sponsors have paid for uh, initial sites, paid up front. Um, we have ongoing donations coming in from, from private individuals, foundations, uh, other NGOs, corporates. Uh, we are constantly looking for, for such people to do that. The head of corporate communications at Volta Revo Authority, Sam Fletcher, hoped that beneficiaries sustain the project. What we do is that we all agree that this is what the community needs. Then we tell them how much it will cost. We also tell them this is what we can provide, what we seek from you in this partnership is for you to take very good care of the, of the project we are bringing to you. If we have adults who will monitor these things and, 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 and guide them as to how to use the facilities properly, it, 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 it will work to everybody's advantage. Maji Foundation has partnered numerous locally based non-governmental organizations to leverage its expertise. Right, so updates of all developing stories on 3news.com. That will do for business. I'm Nanikia Mensah Bampa. Alfred is standing by and wait more. Thank you, Nanikia. The minority says the document on the security cooperation agreement between Ghana and the United States, which was laid in Parliament Tuesday, has not been signed and is procedurally flawed. On Tuesday, the Defence Minister laid a paper in Parliament on security cooperation agreement between Ghana and the United States of America. The agreement was referred to the Constitutional and Legal as well as Defence and Interior Committees. On Wednesday, when the committee met with the Minister of Defence and Interior, it came to light that the memo accompanying the memoranda had not been signed. A member of the Constitutional and Legal Committee, Nelson Dafiamakpo, said the procedure by the executive is flawed. The document they have brought to Parliament is neither an agreement nor is it a bill. So we are asking the government to do the appropriate thing. They should take back the memorandum, execute it, and bring it to Parliament for a ratification. They want to use the backdoor process to leave the agreement for Parliament to review so that if there's a problem tomorrow, then Parliament will be blamed. Me, Roxy Nelson, that former court, I'm a lawyer, of, I'm worth my sort. It ought not to be accepted. Parliament is being hoodwinked. Nobody realized and raised the fundamental issue yesterday on the floor. He says the minority will not be part of it if government does not withdraw the paper. The legislature doesn't sign agreements. We don't participate in negotiating agreements. Yes, what they are doing, they are asking us to negotiate, to be part of the negotiation. It is not our role. The South Dying MP said the security ministers at the committee meeting were struggling to justify the procedure used, but they will insist on the appropriate procedure. Meanwhile, Defence Minister Dominic Nitual, speaking on this issue, has defended the agreement. I am saying to you that get these documents and read them and ask questions why Hana Tete signed this without bringing it to the people of Ghana. It's like give more two. At the blind side of the people of Ghana, why do you go to sign? And the Americans base their preamble on this document that you have signed with us, so we are bringing a, a different agreement. You have also signed, if these documents were not there, I don't think the Americans would have based this agreement on this. They may have started from a lower angle. That was the defense minister's first jab at what he describes as a hypocritical minority, contrary to claims by the minority that the agreement was new and would lead to the creation of a U.S. military base in Ghana 
The Defense Minister Dominic Nitu said the Eswal NDC government signed two previous agreements with the U.S. military, which gave unimpeded access to the U.S. military in Ghana. So I can assure the people of Ghana that after this agreement, you will not even know the U.S. soldiers are in Ghana. Because they are confined. They are not like civilians who move around in town. They move by orders and they are confined. So they come and do training for two, three weeks and they go back. It is when you have a problem like disaster that you will see them coming to help you because of this agreement. That's why you need friends. God forbid if somebody were to attack us and because of this agreement they will assist us. That's all that it means. That we'll have a disaster, we have something we can say, oh, but this agreement, so you have the responsibility to come and assist us. Dominic Nato, while quoting, Portions of the agreement signed in 1998 and 2015 said the past NDC government had already committed the Ghana government to the agreement but failed to bring it to parliament for ratification. The defense agreement with the military in the United States has come under intense scrutiny from the public and experts say the deal is bad for Ghana. The defense minister also took the experts to the cleaners. Attack terrorists into Ghana. Where were those particular uh, uh, security experts? They didn't say anything wrong when those things were signed. Why were they not saying it before? Why are they not criticizing the NDC government for signing secret documents when the people of Ghana didn't even know? Between the two governments, who is more responsible? So if the government considered the deal signed by the past government as bad for Ghana, what significantly has changed this time around? The fact that the U.S. cannot just come to Ghana unlike the 98 one, and start holding guns outside, but that they will consult with the appropriate authorities, Ministry of uh, Interior. And that will not get, give them a blanket tax waiver, but that they will consult with the Ministry of Finance and Parliament. And that they will not just bring their uh, uh, driver's, driver's licenses, but that they will consult with DVLA. While Parliament's Defence and Interior Committee is deliberating on a controversial agreement, Information Minister Mustafa Hamid has this for the media. You, the media, must also help us in calling the NDC out on this behavior so that when they leak documents that are yet to be discussed in parliament to you in order to generate a public discussion ahead of the parliament, you tell them that this is not correct. You have the opportunity and the forum in parliament. Please make your point in parliament. After all, the media is always in parliament. There's a lot more on this in our subsequent bulletin, but with the potential of one in every 1,000 children born likely to suffer from Down syndrome, the challenge for society now is how to support these children medically from birth and socially in order to enhance their future participation and contribution to mainstream society. In this special feature to mark World Down Syndrome Day today, when Delay spent time with patients Bansa and tells her story for those who live with Down syndrome. Good morning. The purpose of my visit is to get to know 39-year-old patient Bansa who suffers from Down syndrome. Patients happens to be that one person born with Down syndrome out of a thousand births each year around the world. How did you get the news that your sister had given birth and the baby had Down syndrome? When she had her, we found she wasn't normal. So their father was in London, so we sent them there. When she was about three months old or so, they went, three, they went there. When they went, they took her to hospital. But we found out that hers wasn't bad. Down syndrome is a type of mental retardation caused by extra genetic material in chromosome 21, a condition that can be caused by a process called non-disjunction. Non-disjunction happens when genetic materials fail to separate during a crucial part of the formation of the gametes, resulting in an extra chromosome called trisomy 21. She wasn't talking. It took her some time before she could talk. We all took it coolly. Having lived with patients for 20 years, 80-year-old Elizabeth Adams, her aunt, says patients sometimes likes to have her own way. The only problem is sometimes she doesn't want to do what you say. She will do what she likes. 
when she does wrong, she said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> then she will blow you some kisses. Persons with Down syndrome can achieve optimal quality of life through parental care and support, medical guidance, and community-based support systems like special schools. The last of three children, Patience, always exhibits independence. She manages to get to school all by herself. Patience has been a student of New Horizon School since 1994. For most people with Down syndrome, it is a lifetime of learning which involves repetitive activity. She easily identifies with daily living skills, including the use of her hands in school. With all these accomplishments, can patients be put on the par with others in all aspects of society? Over the years, negative attitudes and the lack of knowledge about the potential of persons with Down syndrome prevents them from having opportunities and making meaningful contributions. As the world marks Down Syndrome Day, the focus is on how people with Down Syndrome can make contributions throughout their lives, whether at home, in school, or in their communities at large. Hold on. <laughs> people doubt their ability, but we always want you to come in and see what they are able to do, and then you c we can also, as a community, we can also contribute. Those of them who are able to do good work, at the end of every term, we give them some allowance to take. So what we do is we calculate the number of items they are able to do, and then we calculate the profit, and then we give them 50% of whatever comes out of it. In a country with a high rate of unemployment, patients and others like her will fall well below the threshold of employment due to her medical condition. The dream to have a society where persons with intellectual disability bring their skills to the communities they belong to may take a long time to come. The deputy principal of the New Horizon School Workshop says one step to achieving this is to first accepting persons with Down syndrome. Okay. If society understands the situation and understands them, I think we can all together help them so that they can live meaningful life in, lives in society. But we are not accepting them. The irony is that Ghana's president co-chairs the group of eminent persons on sustainable development goals. Goten expects countries like Ghana to strive to reduce inequality within and among countries by empowering and promoting social, economic and political inclusion of all including persons with disability. The acting executive secretary of the National Council on Persons with Disability admits we haven't done enough for people with disability. It looks like more or less for persons with Down syndrome, we seem not to pay the, the required attention to them. It is an area that we should start paying attention and see how best we can also develop their potential. We a beautiful story there, by the way. It's important that such people receive support, especially in education and work. I right? agree with you. Yeah? We're still live here on News 360. We've got some more news for you coming up shortly. Stay with us. Welcome back to News 360. Let's take a look at some more stories this evening. And all 14 accused persons facing trial before an Accra High Court over the murder of Major Maxwell Mahama have pleaded not guilty to the charge of abetment of crime, conspiracy to commit murder, and murder. The assemblyman for the area, William Barr, was the only person amongst the 14 to be charged with abetment of crime. The remaining 13 are facing charges of conspiracy to commit crime, namely murder, and nine have additional charge of murder. The court could not proceed beyond taking their pleas 
after a struggle to put a jury in place. A seven-member panel must be selected from a number more than seven to hear the case, but only seven people were present to form the jury. The High Court, presided over by a Court of Appeal judge with additional responsibilities, Justice Mariama Ousu, urged officials from the Judicial Service to assist the court show up the numbers. The case, which has been adjourned twice, was due to the inability of some of the accused persons to get legal representation. However, all 14 now have lawyers after the court appointed Godwin Jemphy to join defense lawyers George Benashaw, Augustine Jemphy, Augustine Obuo and Seydou Nasigri. Lawyer Nashiru Yusuf is holding a watching brief for the family of the late soldier while Chief State Attorney Evelyn Kills in his leading prosecution. Hearing of the case continues on April 12. Next is some international news. There was jubilation and shock in Dapchi at the unexpected arrival of the girls. The Nigerian government said the army allowed the militant through, so lives were not lost, but denied paying the ransom. Reports, however, suggest at least five girls died during the kidnapping and that a Christian girl remains captive. One of the freed girls, in a phone conversation with a relative, said the five had been crushed to death as they were headed into vehicles and driven away. The government did not make any mention of deaths. The girls said they were taken into the bush to an enclosed place. The return of more than 70 Dabchi school girls indicates that a Boko Haram faction led by Abu Musab al-Banawi is taking a different approach to kidnappings. He goes. Visit our website, it's 3news.com for some more international news. Next is some entertainment news with Nana Ado. Entertainment news is brought to you by... All right, so it's now time for some entertainment news with me, Nana Kwejuado, brought to you by Vodafone, Power to You, and Fanmax, Fuel Your Day. Now, today is World Poetry Day, as March 21, so we are marking World Poetry Day, a day to celebrate poets and their works of art. Now, Ghana is blessed with so many promising talents. Uh, gifted female guitarist and poet Seiji is one of such amazing talents. <laughs> Wait. That's the title of the piece. Wait. 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 He has no shoes on his feet. This morning he woke on the street with no food to eat. And yet somehow he's expected to dance to the tune and the beat of this cruel world. They left him for dead when he was only but a heartbeat. Pounding and pounding, his chest is exploding. Then his head starts spinning, but your car will stop moving. Walking, he's jogging. Next thing he starts running, your coin has to flow. This life he had bought, see he's weak, he's cold. His eyes, they show. His hopes, his dreams, his stories untold. Stuck on a runabout of the wrong way, unable to break free. Suddenly he cries out for help and we all can. See. For me, when I was writing it, I was thinking about when you see someone going through, through suffering and you have a means of helping, a way of helping, I think you should do it and don't wait till tomorrow. Or... So how long shall we wait until there's no pain in his eyes? Oh. <laughs> well, I've loved poetry for a long time, for about 10 years now. I did literature in school, so I've been writing since then. But professionally, I started this about eight months ago to actually come out as sage and then do poetry. It's, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. The response, I didn't expect this kind of response because I know that the poetry market is not as large as probably music or rap here in Ghana. So for me, the response has been really helpful and great, and I'm grateful to Ryan Sonny too for pushing me. I do not say this because I want the children to come out and play. Go away, for when you come, she and her sisters are left desolate. They are back so broken from carrying all of the world's weight on your fragile shoulders. Have mercy, Ray. 
it's quite evident that for most of the art forms is dominated by men and poetry is no different but we are trying to you know effect change and bring some sort of movement so i think there are a few female poets who are and spoken word artists who are also doing really well and i know that it's only a matter of time maya angelo set the pace for for us there are quite a number of um, amazing female poets out there and so and um, don't lose hope you could be the one to to um influence somebody else to also take up poetry and so if you're out there and you know you love poetry don't hold back i held back for a long time and only to find out that there was actually a market for this all right so poetry we are underrating poets like uh, like that but uh, alfredo Kansei is one such great poet popular politician and general secretary of the ndc in ketia aka general mosquito is at the center of the latest social media trolling now guess what his blunder is this time it appears general mosquito never runs parallel to controversy Almost everything the popular politician does sets tongues wagging. In January 2015, General rocked a smart camel-colored fur-trimmed jacket. Well, Ghanaians were not at all charitable with their comments. A whole General Mosquito was teased for wearing a female winter coat. I didn't find it necessary to go and buy a winter jacket for two days' visit. So I've always been going with my wife's jacket. Okay, fast forward to December 2016. Asiedu Inketia wore a cap on Batakari. The next minute, Asiedu Inketia was trending. Again, the general became the subject of social media trolling. The trolling never ceases to end. Once again, Asiedu Inketia is being teased for wearing oversized shoes why always a see you gets here All right, so why always is here doing KTI is the question we are asking, and that's about it for entertainment and lifestyle news with me, Nana Quadrado, brought to you by Vodafone, power to you, and Fanmax through all your day. Don't forget, this weekend is packed, and so make sure you are getting all the best out of it. Yes, absolutely. Ken. Thank Thanks you so that. much <laughs> for spending your 60 minutes with us here on News 360. On behalf of the rest of the team, we're grateful. My name is Alfred Akansi. And I'm Natalie Ford. Visit our website, 3news.com, for some more news. News at 10 0 simulcast on our sister station, that's 3FM 92.7. Thanks so much for watching. Have an incredible evening.